Welcome to the intriguing world of electrolytes. In the delicate equilibrium of homeostasis, they are the conductors orchestrating our body's electrical symphony. Electrolytes are the commanding force of each electrical conduction behind every single one of our heartbeats. Electrolytes are the maestros of the human body's neurological symphony, expertly coordinating every thought, every memory, and every sensation with exquisite precision and harmony. Behind the scenes of movement, electrolytes are the masterful puppeteers of muscle. They are the ones gracefully choreographing every contraction and every movement. Each organ, each cell in our body owes its very function to the delicate equilibrium of these vital substances, electrolytes. As healthcare providers, we stand as the vigilant sentinels of this balance. In critical care, our knowledge becomes our strength and the strength to restore, to rejuvenate, to preserve the miraculous homeostasis that sustains life. So come study with me. Together, we will uncover their secrets and learn to harness their power in the quest to heal and maintain the most intricate, beautiful machine known, the human body. This episode will focus on hypo and hypernatremia. Information from this video comes from live review courses I've taken, such as Barclay & Associate AGACMP review course or ANAs. Then we have leading healthcare resources such as UpToDate. Remember to check out the whole series for the electrolytes, and we will have sodium, calcium, potassium, magnesium. Comment if there is another electrolyte that you want me to cover. Let's talk about the relationship between electrolytes and sodium. Starting with potassium, hyperkalemia, which is high potassium levels, can sometimes be associated with conditions that also cause hyponatremia, such as adrenal insufficiency. Now, hypokalemia, low potassium levels, can lead to changes in the renal sodium handling potential impacting hyponatremia. Chloride, or disorders of chloride, such as hypochloremia, can be associated with certain types of hyponatremia, particularly in the setting of gastrointestinal losses like prolonged vomiting, where both sodium and chloride are lost. With magnesium and calcium, severe hypomagnesemia, low magnesium, and hypocalcemia, low calcium, can sometimes contribute to renal sodium wasting, thereby influencing hyponatremia. These electrolyte imbalances often coexist due to the shared underlying causes. Glucose with hyperglycemia can lead to hypertonic hyponatremia. High blood glucose levels cause an osmotic shift of water from the intracellular to the extracellular space, diluting sodium concentrations. Bicarbonate, metabolic alkalosis, can affect sodium balance and distribution, but the relationship is more complex and often involves multiple factors including renal function and respiratory compensation. In clinical practice, when evaluating and managing hyponatremia, it's essential to consider the overall electrolyte balance and look for the potential causes or contributing factors that might affect the sodium levels. This comprehensive approach ensures accurate diagnoses and effective treatment. Hyponatremia is defined as a serum sodium concentration below the normal range. The normal range for serum sodium is typically considered to be between 135 and 145 milli equivalents per liter. Hyponatremia can be classified into different categories based on the severity of the sodium deficit. Mild hyponatremia is usually between 130 and 134. Moderate hyponatremia is between 125 and 129, and severe hyponatremia serum sodium levels are less than 125. It is important to note that the clinical significance of hyponatremia depends not only on the absolute value of the serum sodium, but also the rate at which the hyponatremia has developed. 
rapidly developing hyponatremia over hours to a few days can be more dangerous and symptomatic than slowly developing hyponatremia over several days to weeks. This is even if the serum sodium level is the same in both cases. Hyponatremia or low sodium levels in the blood can present with a variety of signs and symptoms which can vary depending on the severity and the rapidity of the onset. Common signs and symptoms that clinicians may observe most significant to recognize is the changes in neurological symptoms. This may indicate the severity of the hyponatremia. Due to brain swelling and increased intracranial pressure in mild to moderate hyponatremia, you can see changes such as headache, nausea, fatigue, muscle cramps, confusion, and severe hyponatremia. Neurological signs will be more pronounced like seizure, stupor, coma, and in rare times, death. Physical findings include orthostatic hypotension, which is a drop in the blood pressure when standing, signs of dehydration, like dry mucous membranes, decreased skin turgor, and hypovolemic hyponatremia, signs of fluid overload like edema or ascites. In hypervolemic hyponatremia, you'll see muscular symptoms such as muscle weakness, spasms, or cramps. It's important for clinicians to recognize that the presentation of hyponatremia can be quite variable and that symptoms are often more related to the rate of decrease in serum sodium levels rather than the absolute level. Rapid decreases in serum sodium are more likely to produce severe acute symptoms, while gradual decreases may be asymptomatic or present with mild symptoms, even at very low sodium levels. Early detection and treatment of hyponatremia are crucial to prevent complications, particularly neurological ones, which can be serious, potentially life-threatening. Expanding on the initial approach to determine the underlying cause of hyponatremia involves various evaluation techniques. First, start with looking for signs and symptoms that include nausea, headache, confusion, seizures, indicating severity. Next, during the medical history, ask about any history of liver, kidney, heart disease, or recent surgeries that could contribute to a fluid imbalance. Medication review is essential. Certain medications like diuretics and antidepressants can lead to hyponatremia. Important laboratory tests include serum electrolytes to get your measured sodium and other electrolyte levels. You also want to do a serum osmolality that distinguishes between types of hyponatremia and then your urine sodium that differentiates between uh, whether renal or non-renal causes of hyponatremia. Lastly, there should be a volume status assessment. During the physical examination, check for signs of dehydration to determine if they are hypovolemic or fluid overload to determine if they are hypervolemic. Also, sudden body weight changes can indicate fluid gain or loss. With the clinical assessment and history, first you want to look for those symptoms and signs that we briefly reviewed earlier. Look for symptoms like nausea, headache, confusion, seizures, indicating the severity. The medical history is going to assess for the history of liver, kidney, heart diseases, or recent surgeries that could contribute to the fluid imbalances. And don't forget to check the medications, such as diuretics and antidepressants. It's important to be aware of medications that cause hyponatremia. This knowledge is crucial for diagnosis and managing electrolyte imbalances in patients. Here's a list of common medications. I'll review each class quickly Please pause to read the specific names for each class of medication I'm going to review. 
So we have the diuretics, we have psych meds, we have pain meds, we have our ACE and ARBs, which it is significantly emphasized, uh, and then diabetic medications and chemo. And although not a prescription medication, it's worth noting that recreational use of MDMA can lead to severe hyponatremia due to its ADH-like effects. It's essential to consider the overall electrolyte imbalance and look for potential causes or contributing factors that might affect sodium levels. This comprehensive approach ensures accurate diagnosis and effective treatment. The laboratory test that we want to focus on for hyponatremia is the electrolyte itself and the other electrolytes. We also want to make sure we assess their serum osmolality, which is the normal range between 280 and 290. And then we need to assess their urine sodium. This is going to be a normal range between 10 and 20. We want to also include other tests that may be related to the hyponatremia that is a part of their H&P or your own physical assessment. Here is another view of different tests that you can order that may be related to the hyponatremia by the system that they are looking for. So uh, I have it for the endocrine, thyroid function, and adrenal function. I have it listed for liver. There's an others category, and then there's one for the lipids and protein. Serum osmolality is important in the management of hyponatremia. Normal serum osmolality is approximately between 275 and 295. This range can slightly vary depending on the laboratory and the methods used for the measurement. Serum osmolality reflects the concentration of solutes in the blood and is crucial in the parameter in assessing the fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. Determining serum osmolality helps in identifying potential underlying causes of hyponatremia, such as SIADH, dehydration, heart failure, liver disease, renal disorders, and medication effects. Serum osmolality is a measure of the solute concentration in the blood and is determined by several factors, including sodium, glucose, and urea. To quickly estimate serum osmolality using sodium levels, you can use a simplified formula which primarily takes into account the sodium concentration. This approximation is often used clinically because sodium and its accompanying anions chloride and bicarbonate are the most significant contributors to the serum osmolality. The simplified formula for estimated serum osmolality is two times the serum sodium. This formula assumes that the contributions of other solutes like glucose and urea are relatively small or constant and that sodium represents the major determinant of osmolality in the clinical situation. An example is if a patient's serum sodium level is 140, the estimated serum osmolality would be two times 140 equals 280. While the calculated value using the serum osmolality formula, which includes glucose of 100 in this example, and a BUN of 15 equates to a serum osmolality of 290.91. This is compared to the estimated value we did, and that is 280. Not too bad of a difference. Remember, this is a quick estimation and does not account for those factors like severe hyperglycemia or significant uremia, which can also influence serum osmolality. In more complex cases, or if precise measurement is required, the full formula, including the glucose and urea, which is your BUN, level should be used. I've provided that for you on the screen. Let's now incorporate serum osmolality and how it differentiates with the three types of hyponatremia, 
The first one is hypotonic hyponatremia. The second one is isotonic or pseudo hyponatremia. And then we have hypertonic hyponatremia. Working with hypotonic hyponatremia, this type is the most common type and occurs when there is a serum osmolality and it is low at approximately less than 280. It suggests a true excess of water relative to sodium. The second type is a pseudo hyponatremia, and this is a hyponatremia with a normal serum osmolality. It often is seen with marked hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia. Pseudo hyponatremia is a laboratory artifact where the sodium concentration appears falsely low due to the high levels of lipid or protein in the blood. Lastly, hypertonic hyponatremia. This occurs when serum osmolality is high, greater than 295. This is usually caused by the presence of osmotically active substances in the blood, such as glucose and hyperglycemia, or mannitol, which draws water out of the cells, diluting the sodium in the serum. After assessing serum osmolality, it is important to look at urine sodium levels. Urine sodium levels help in understanding the fluid status and differentiating causes of hyponatremia. The purpose and how it's used is important. When you see low urine sodium levels, like less than 10, this suggests extra renal causes of hyponatremia like dehydration, GI loss, where the kidneys are appropriately trying to conserve sodium. Now, when you have high urine sodium, greater than 20, this indicates renal causes of hyponatremia, such as diuretic use, renal salt wasting, or conditions like SIADH, where the kidneys excrete high levels of sodium. Really quickly, let's review the difference between random spot and 24-hour urine collection. The random spot urine sodium collection, when used, this test is quick and convenient, often used in acute care settings or for initial assessment. Clinical context includes to evaluate acute changes in fluid status or electrolyte imbalances. When a rapid assessment is needed, such as in an emergency situation or initial hospital admission. It's useful in differential diagnoses of hyponatremia or acute kidney injury. The actual 24-hour urine collection when used, this test is more comprehensive and accurate for assessing total daily sodium excretion. The clinical context includes chronic conditions where understanding daily sodium balance is important like chronic kidney disease, hypertension, or heart failure. To evaluate ongoing issues with fluid and electrolyte balance, especially when daily dietary sodium intake and renal sodium handling need to be assessed over time. In cases of suspected renal tubular disorders where the pattern of sodium excretion throughout the day can provide diagnostic clues. Assessing fluid balance and hyponatremia will determine whether your patient has hypovolemic or hypervolemic hyponatremia. If your patient has hypovolemic hyponatremia, you're going to have a history in diarrhea, vomiting, maybe excess sweating, use of diuretics, or decreased fluid intake are just some examples. You may find physical assessments such as dry mucous membranes, decreased skin turgor, orthostatic hypotension, tachycardia. Now, if you have a patient that is hypervolemic, you will see a history of maybe heart failure, liver disease like cirrhosis, kidney disease, or use of meds causing fluid retention. Physical assessments may include bilateral lower extremity edema, ascites, or jugular venous distension. If you look at the BUN and creatinine, a high BUN with a normal or slightly elevated creatinine will give you decreased renal perfusion, which could be seen with signs of concentrated urine, dehydration, and hypovolemic states. Both BUN and creatinine elevated proportionately 
it is going to indicate intrinsic kidney damage. When you look at the BUN to creatinine ratio, the normal ratio is 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 in between. An increased ratio, such as greater than 20 to 1, is going to indicate pre-renal, such as dehydration or reduced blood flow to the kidneys. Decreased or normal ratio with an elevated BUN and creatinine, this is going to indicate intrinsic renal damage. For hypertonic hyponatremia, you will see high serum osmolality, such as greater than 290. Hyperglycemia and HHS are the most common cause for high osmolality and low sodium levels. Moving to treatment, treatment based on cause. The first step in managing hyponatremia is to identify the underlying cause. There are multiple potential causes such as medications, heart failure, renal failure, or SIADH. Each cause will have a specific treatment approach. For example, if hyponatremia is due to heart failure, then optimizing heart failure management would be the key step. A urine sodium level greater than 20 millimoles per liter suggests that the kidney is excreting sodium and can indicate conditions like diuretic use, adrenal insufficiency, or kidney problems. Other treatment strategies include, for example, a patient with bilateral lower extremities that has a lot of edema and is deemed hypervolemic, you would implement water restriction because there is too much fluid in the body. Hypervolemia can be seen in certain kidney diseases, heart failure, or liver cirrhosis. Restricting water intake helps to balance the sodium concentrations. If the patient becomes symptomatic, give normal saline IV with a loop diuretic. If there are symptoms due to low sodium, such as mild or moderate confusion, maybe some headache, administer IV normal saline alongside with that loop diuretic like Lasix, and this can help. The saline helps to increase the sodium levels while the diuretic removes that excess fluid to prevent that overload. If CNS symptoms are present, please consider 3% hypertonic saline IV with loop diuretic. Central nervous system symptoms like severe confusion, seizures, or coma are medical emergencies. In such cases, 3% hypertonic saline, which is much higher in concentration than normal saline, is used to rapidly increase the sodium concentration. This is done in conjunction with a loop diuretic. There should be a right answer that is 3% and has some kind of slow and calculated rate. If hyponatremia shows up on the test with a patient that has cerebral edema, which hypotonic hyponatremia is it? Once you've identified serum osmolality low being less than 280 for your hyponatremic patient, you want to identify if the patient is hypo or hypervolemic. Then you want to identify if the patient is renal versus non-renal causes for the hyponatremia. If you have hypovolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia, you must go ahead and look at the urine sodium to identify the difference. We need to understand serum sodium, serum osmolality, and urine sodium in relation to hypotonic hyponatremia. When evaluating a patient with symptoms of dehydration, diarrhea, and vomiting, and you have clinical findings like hypovolemia, low urine sodium, which is the less than 10 milliequivalents per liter, and low serum osmolality, it's important to integrate these clinical laboratory findings to understand the underlying pathophysiology. So let's talk about how these components interrelate. Now, dehydration, diarrhea, and vomiting, we know that these conditions lead to a loss of fluids and electrolytes, including sodium from the body. This loss can result in hypovolemia, which is the decreased volume of circulating blood in the body. The body responds to the loss by trying to conserve water and sodium to maintain that circulatory volume and blood pressure. The kidneys play a key role in this conservation process. When there is low urine sodium, less than 10, in the setting of hypovolemia, the kidneys increase reabsorption of sodium to compensate for the loss, leading to low levels of sodium in the urine. A urine sodium level less than 10 milliequivalents per liter in this context suggests that the kidneys are functioning appropriately 
greatly to conserve sodium due to the body's perception of decreased blood volume. Now, low serum osmolality, which we have identified to be less than 280, this indicates a relative dilution of blood solutes. In cases of dehydration due to diarrhea and vomiting, low serum osmolality might seem paradoxical. However, it can occur if the fluid loss is primarily isotonic, containing a similar concentration of solutes as the blood. And if the patient has ingested or been administered hypotonic fluids, fluids with lower concentrations of solutes than blood in response to dehydration. Assess the patient for signs of dehydration like dry mucous membranes, decreased skin turgor, tachycardia, and hypotension. Evaluate the severity of the diarrhea and vomiting and the potential for the iso isotonic or hypotonic fluid losses. Consider the patient's fluid intake and any treatments that they may have received. Treatment considerations and management and focuses on fluid and electrolyte losses is important. For hypervolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia, you're going to see signs and symptoms such as edema, congestive heart failure, liver disease, chronic renal failure. Again, remember, it's the most common cause of hyponatremia. This is from up to date. It is not from the review courses. I was just very interested in the 3% saline administration and its calculations, and this is what I found for acute hyponatremia. Now, acute hyponatremia is hyponatremia that has developed in less than 48 hours. In cases of self-induced water intoxication, acute Hyponatremia can be presumed to have developed over the prior 48 hours, but if the duration is unclear, hyponatremia should not be considered acute, and what I'm about to re uh, go over with you should not be applied to that kind of hyponatremia. Severe hyponatremia is defined as serum concentration less than 120. Moderate hyponatremia is defined as serum concentration from 120 to 129. Common causes of acute hyponatremia include IV fluid administration, for example, postoperatively, water intoxication, example, in distant runners or psychotic patients with extreme polydipsia, maybe users of MDMA or ecstasy, clinical features, unlike with chronic hyponatremia, any symptoms, whether mild or severe, that may be associated with increased intracranial pressure constitutes an emergency. Examples include confusion, gait or movement disturbances, tremor, nausea, vomiting, headaches, seizures, uptundation, and coma, respiratory arrest. It's important to know diagnostic evaluation and when possible, focused physical examination should include assessment of respirations, orthostatic blood pressure, pupil size, and light reflex. Volume status such as skin turgor, oral mucosa, and edema with neurological function assessment like mental status, gait reflexes, focal deficit is important. Obtain the following laboratory studies. Order a serum creatinine, serum electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, and bicarbonate. You want serum glucose, urine sodium, urine potassium, urine osmolality, urine creatinine. Initial management is going to have to treat all acutely hyponatremic patients manifesting any symptoms possibly due to increased intracranial pressure with a 100 milliliter bolus of 3%. Let's see how that's done. So again, we are treating acute hyponatremia that has developed in less than 48 hours as a serum sodium of less than 120 and risk or signs of brain herniation. We want to administer 3% hypertonic saline. And this is a critical intervention for severe hyponatremia, particularly when there are symptoms of that cerebral edema or increased intracranial pressure. This is usually tailored for a provider managing a patient with severe hyponatremia in the ICU, you always want to confirm the indication and ensure that the patient has severe hyponatremia. You have to calculate the need. Determine the sodium deficit and how much you need to raise serum sodium to alleviate symptoms without overcorrecting. Okay, dosing is so important because the initial goal is to increase serum sodium by four to six milliequivalents per liter over a few hours. For a 70 kilogram adult, raising serum sodium by one milliequivalent per liter requires approximately 
1.6 milliliters per kilogram of 3% saline. When administering, you want to start with a bolus, often 100 milliliter of 3% saline given over 10 minutes. You may give additional boluses up to two to three total. If symptoms persist, monitor closely though after each bolus. When you're monitoring, you should be checking serum sodium every one to two hours initially and assessing the response and avoiding any overcorrection. You want to adjust treatment. If you've achieved the target, increase and symptoms have improved, stop the boluses. If serum sodium rises too quickly or symptoms worsen, you may need to slow down or stop the infusion and consider other interventions. It's so important to prevent overcorrection. Do not increase serum sodium more than 8 milliequivalents per liter in the first 24 hours to avoid the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. Documenting and reassessing is so important, so continuously document the patient's neurological status, fluid balance, and serum electrolytes. Reassess the treatment plan based on the patient's dynamic clinical status. Once the patient is stable, transition to a maintenance regimen and address the underlying cause of the hyponatremia. Remember, this is just a general guide. Each patient needs can be different and unique, so interventions should be tailored accordingly. So always consult current guidelines and hospital protocols. The treatment of hyponatremia in hospitalized patients has four important goals. To prevent further declines in serum sodium concentration, to decrease intracranial pressure in patients at risk for developing brain herniation, to relieve symptoms of hyponatremia, and to avoid excessive correction of hyponatremia in patients at risk for osmotic demyelination syndrome. It's important to identify who is actually at high risk for osmotic demyelination syndrome. These would be the patients that are serum sodium concentrations of less than or equal to 105, and those with hypokalemia, alcohol use disorder, malnutrition, liver disease, and possibly hypophosphatemia. Let's now review chronic hyponatremia. Many hyponatremic patients appear to be asymptomatic. However, asymptomatic patients, particularly those with chronic hyponatremia of moderate severity, which is the 120 to 129, may have subtle impairments in mentation and gait, and an increased risk of falls and fractures. So it's really important that we also consider those when we don't consider them to be asymptomatic. So chronic mild hyponatremia is your serum sodium 130 to 134. It's not treated with 3% saline because it's chronic. You want to make sure that you do see any drugs that are causing the hyponatremia. You want to identify and reverse any causes. And this is the patient that you could use fluid restriction. Moderate to severe hyponatremia with the serum sodium less than 130. This depends on symptom severity, presence or absence of any intracranial pathology like TBI or ICH is really important to consider. Now, severe symptoms or known intracranial pathology, you can use 3% at a rate of 15 to 30 milliliters an hour administered via peripheral IV. 3% saline rather than normal saline in patients with and without suspected hypovolemia. An alternative option is to give 1 milliliters per kilogram at a max of 100 milliliters boluses of 3% saline IV Q6 hours. The max rate of correction should be 8 milliequivalents per liter in any 24-hour period. Desmopressin for high risk of developing ODS. We are done with hyponatremia. Let's move on to hypernatremia, which is a much shorter lecture. Hypernatremia is defined by a serum sodium level greater than 145. Hypernatremia due to water depletion is called dehydration. This is different from hypovolemia in which both salt and water are lost. Hypernatremia is seen primarily in patients 
who cannot experience or respond to thirst normally due to impaired mental status, for example, an older adult or maybe critically ill patient. Other causes of hypernatremia include skin loss, GI loss, diabetes insipidus, osmotic diuresis, hypothalamic lesions, or salt poisoning in rare cases, but usually it's excess water loss. So when you're considering either the etiology or the treatment of hypernatremia, it is the sodium plus potassium concentration in the fluid lost or the fluid given, not the osmolality, that determines the effect on the serum sodium. In patients who are both hypernatremic and hypokalemic, the addition of potassium to the administered fluid will diminish the amount of electrolyte, free water that is given thereby limiting the reduction in serum sodium. Both upper and lower GI losses can result in hypernatremia when water intake is limited. Hypernatremia is chronic if it has been present for longer than 48 hours. Nearly all patients with hypernatremia will have chronic hypernatremia, even those who present with acute changes in mentation. In clinically stable patients, chronic hypernatremia can be corrected with oral rehydration if level of consciousness is normal and the patient can drink adequately or by administering water through a nasogastric tube. General management of hypernatremia has a net positive balance of 3 milliliters per kilogram of lean body weight and electrolyte-free water will lower serum sodium by 1 milliequivalents per liter. And this can be done with a general management, uh, for example, for severe hypernatremia with hypovolemia. We want to give normal saline followed with half normal saline. And then for hypernatremia with euvolemia, the D5W free water is the appropriate choice. And then for hypernatremia with hypervolemia, free water with loop diuretics if needed, is the best choice. And for hypernatremia and oliguric, aka dialysis, is your option. So from up to date, I did get some rates for this. And for chronic hypernatremia greater than 48 hours, uh, they have the D5W IV, 150 milliliters an hour is the max, approximately going at 1.35 milliliters per hour per kilogram, or you can just do 70 milliliters an hour in a 50 kilogram patient, or 100 milliliters an hour in a 70 kilogram patient. Again, stable patients can do oral rehydration. And acute hypernatremia, which is less than 48 hours, you want to give D5W IV. You want to set that to go at 6 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Always monitor your blood glucose every 1 to 3 hours until your sodium is less than 145. Once the sodium is equal to 145, you want to decrease D5W to 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour. The goal is that we rapidly lower sodium first few hours as much as 8 milliequivalents per liter per hour. Now, with DI, you could do desmopressin. There is a risk of hyperglycemia with the D5. If you want to, you can slow the rate or you can change to 2.5 DW after several hours. We are finally done with hyponatremia and hypernatremia. Thank you so much for studying with me today and I'll see you at the next one. Don't forget to subscribe. Mm -hmm.